You've been an inspiration. A lot of the current AI revolution has to pay credit to you. It's Mustafa Suleiman. Mustafa Suleiman, the CEO of Microsoft AI. CEO of Microsoft AI. Co-founder of DeepMind. One of the OGs of the AI world. Spent more than a decade at the forefront of this industry before we even had gotten to feel it in the past couple of years now. There's going to be a point in the future where these AI agents go out and make money by themselves. Just take a moment to think about how crazy it is that you can ask that question. If anyone can go out there and just say, hey, spin me software that does ABCD, what happens to the entire field of software as a service? Instead of just a computer being able to say things, it will actually be able to do things. It will take actions. It'll learn to use APIs. It'll buy things. It'll write emails. It'll make phone calls, just as an entrepreneur would. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm with Mustafa Suleiman, who, you know, to be honest, you've been an inspiration ever since DeepMind. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the current AI revolution has to pay credit to you. So thank you so much for doing everything you do. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this very quick session. I'm just going to start with questions. I'm just going to dive in. The first question I had, and I remember reading this one tweet about you a long time ago where somebody spoke about your version of the modern Turing test. So you had spoken about the modern Turing test where you said that there's going to be a point in the future where these AI agents, they're sort of able to uh, you know, go out and make money by themselves, right? Without too much human intervention. And we've started to see some of that in pockets, right? There's still some human intervention. Like we are a good example. We use avatars on YouTube and Instagram, and that's last month we did close to about 80 million views, right? At some point, that's going to be an agentic process where there need not be humans involved. My question to you is now that we're seeing some of this evidence, what are your predictions now? First of all, just take a moment to think about how crazy it is that you can ask that question. Just, just really think. People have spent 50 or 60 years being inspired by the Turing test, right? And so I, I think many of your viewers will know what the Turing test is, but just for those who don't, it is uh, a long ago prediction by the amazing computer scientist and mathematician Alan Turing, who basically said that intelligence is when you can sort of convince somebody else that the AI system is a human, and they can't really tell whether it's a human or whether it's an AI system because it speaks so fluently, yeah. right? That was the Turing test, the imitation game. and. In the last year or so, we've kind of just breezed past that moment, right? We've sort of passed the Turing test, and nothing seems to be, uh, you know, nothing seems to have changed. That's really profound. Um, so, like, with that said, I sort of, you know, kind of proposed a different version of that, where, um, you know, instead of just a computer being able to say things, it will actually be able to do things. It'll take actions, right? It'll learn to use APIs. It'll buy things, it'll write emails, it'll make phone calls, um, just as an entrepreneur would or an office worker would. And um, we're now at the moment where it hasn't quite approached that, but sometime in the next few years, you know, you're right. It's probably going to be the case that an AI could generate new videos on YouTube, um, try and promote them on social media to optimize their watch time. Um, you know, potentially try and monetize them in different ways, maybe create merchandise for the show, all kinds of things. And that is a, you know, it is a pretty wild moment to be in. It's, a, it's amazing capabilities that I think are going to make us all much more sort of creative. How does that change the economy? I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of smart people that take advantage of this. And a lot of other people who feel like they're being outcompeted now by agents. You had other humans to compete with in the past, now you also have agents to compete with. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, think about it like this. I mean, we've, we all sort of adopt technologies at different times. Um, but net-net, we all end up using televisions, using cars, having smartphones. Um, and, you know, something that feels sort of profound and scary and uncertain and, you know, suddenly feels everyday and mundane, right? It's kind of incredible that, you know, I can leave a voice note for my friend and dispatch that to another part of the universe. It's incredible that I could have an idea and in two sentences visualize that idea in an image. Um, and I, I just in general think sort of people underrate how profound the current moment is. Um, and we get desensitized to 
um, you know, things that are already around us and are actually super significant all the time. And so to be creative in this moment is actually to be open-minded and to test and iterate and absorb and integrate and play with everything at our disposal. And then you get to see the limitations of it, right? Because if you don't engage with something, you over idolize it as though it's like, you know, so much more than it actually is. But when you really play with these models, you see, okay, they're amazing and inspiring in some ways, but they're also super limited in some ways. And that gives you an intuition for how to use them, when not to use them, how to mitigate their weaknesses. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's the sort of way to think about adoption. I think one follow up question here is a lot of our audience is software engineers. And a lot of the work we do in our company, in the past, we of course wrote code. Now we're increasingly seeing us use GitHub Copilot, a bunch of other tools, and starting to see that we're offloading some of our work there to the point where it feels like we're writing English, right? Which is awesome in the first place. But secondly, what does that do to software? Because if anyone can go out there and just say, hey, spin me software that does ABCD, and then just get the, the app or the tool, and they're able to use it, what happens to the entire field of software as a service? Yeah. It's a great question, and and you know maybe if you look back, um, it's kind of easier to see that this has been the course of software development for many decades, right? We've been creating languages of increasing abstraction, all the way from binary and assembly language up to you know now low code and no code languages for a long time. And even when you know you write Python, you're really calling on a bunch of existing libraries. There's many many libraries that you're not writing from scratch every time. And um, so just as you strung together a whole series of different libraries, now you're sort of giving a single instruction to compose an entire you know, sub-component of a program or maybe even the entire program itself. So what does that mean? It means that it reduces the barrier to entry to getting stuff done. It makes it easier for anybody with fewer skills, if you like, um, to write a piece of software, um, create an application, design something, see it produced in the real world, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have more experimentation of different ideas faster. And so we're trying out as a species collectively all the different paths of possible combinations of ideas that we could combine. Um, and that in itself is going to increase the rate of discovery of new things, new business models, new product applications, you know, new scientific ideas which in turn is collectively going to drive the overall productivity of our civilization unlike anything before because after all invention has been the thing that has driven you know our species from the beginning of time to reduce human suffering to find shelter to make it easier to get food to reduce conflict and so that trajectory is about to go exponential another question here is around you know cognitive effort right i was talking about this before the pod went live where you know i was looking at a really big number with a lot of commas and Instead of me figuring out what that number was, I just picked it up, put it into an LLM, and said, hey, what number is this, right? I wanted the number in billions or trillions or whatever. And it just gave me the answer. You know, that's something I would have figured out in three seconds. But I didn't take the effort to take those three seconds, I just dumped it in. Sometimes with YouTube videos, I just pull out the entire video, dump it into uh, you know, an LLM, and say, please give me a summary of this. So do you feel like at some point we're starting to get cognitively lazier, and a lot of the tasks we used to do on a Microsoft Office or an Excel, they kept the brain sharp, right? Do you feel we're losing the bicycle for the mind? You know, throughout evolutionary history, we as a species acquire knowledge and skills which enable us to adapt to whatever the environment requires of us. And then we, we lose those knowledge and skills as, you know, civilization evolves. Like in the past, it would have been important for us as foragers to know which berries were poisonous or you know which animals were likely to attack us or not right and we sort of drop that information over time it becomes less and less valuable to you know memorize you know certain pieces of information and more and more valuable to focus on creativity and judgment and so on so in a, as i was saying sort of i think it reduces the barrier to entry to creativity right it make because i don't have to spend years learning to be a great programmer, I can now try something out quickly, then what the kind of evolutionary story is optimizing for is 
you know, my ability to in, invent a new idea, a new concept, an abstract layer, rather than my ability to be able to execute on it. Um, so in a way, it's sort of exercising a different part of our brain. And yes, atrophying a certain part of our brain. Like for sure, you know, now that we all have smartphones, we don't memorize telephone numbers like we might have done back in the day. Um, or maybe we don't memorize our times table as much, right? Or maybe we're a bit less good at maps navigation because we all have a, you know, a map on our phone. Should that affect education for youngsters now? Because we still do the times table and we still do a lot of things that <laughs> at this point none of us would do. Yeah. Do you think education, like especially K-12 education, has to change now that agents are a thing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I think it's already changing. I mean, if you compare it to sort of 20, 30 years ago pre, pre-digital, it is a different educational environment to know that you now have access to information at your fingertips. And obviously people worry that it means people are just going to sort of copy and not be, you know, um, you know not, not sort of ingest or learn or memorize new information. And that's going to remain important. Um, but I think we just have to be kind of deliberate about it. It is a, in a new phase. Every tool gives us an amplification of some skills and a kind of atrophying of other skills. And we just have to sort of balance that in, in tension with one another. Interesting. I want, I want to talk about Microsoft a little bit, right? I think you guys have a huge campus here in India, in Hyderabad, and you know something like 20,000 plus employees. Uh, what is what is Microsoft's commitment to doing AI well in India? Like, are there engineers here who are contributing to Copilot? Like, what's the what's the India play here? Yeah, I, I mean, we actually, even here in Bangalore, I have team members who are contributing to Copilot and contributing to our advertising stack, contributing to our search relevance, search quality. Um, so, you know, this is some of the best engineers in the world. India itself is one of the most popular. Uh, markets for Copilot. It's growing faster than most other markets. It's really quite impressive. So it's a, it's a big part of what we're going to do. Interesting. I have one last question for you, which is, can you tell me the top three, like from your, you know, backend data, right? What are the top three use cases of Copilot today? And then also paint a picture of where Copilot goes three years from now and what that looks like. What are the top three use cases, you know, in 2027 or 2028? Yeah, I mean, top top use cases are, I think, replacing your search engine. Today? Yeah. I mean, many, many people are using it for everyday queries. Um, you know, what is the GDP of this? Or where do I find that? Or, you know, what did this person do? You know, generic queries that you might otherwise put to a search engine. Second is, I think, education. You know, it's definitely a help for college and school. And third is, I think, increasingly, I'm seeing people use it for companionship. Uh, and emotional support, helping to think through a tricky problem that you're working through. Because, you know, Copilot today is not judgmental. It doesn't put you down. It asks, you know, it's always there to talk to you in a very sort of simple and calming way. So I think those are the kind of big use cases. But tomorrow, or sort of in years to come, um, you know, these models are going to sort of have near perfect memory, right? So they're going to be very uh, useful as a kind of second brain for you. Like anything that occurs to you, any idea that you have, any open question that you have, any historic documents that you have, any tasks that you have, it's really gonna be a way for you to sort of augment your everyday thought process and brain. And that's kind of what I mean by an AI companion that's always at your side, seeing what you see, hearing what you hear, and living life alongside you. Do you think it's gonna be a friend? Do you think I'd be able to give it a name? Because I do that a lot. I spar with Copilot a lot, right? Which is, hey, I have this idea, can you help me flesh it out? And I, and I know a lot of smart people that do that. At some point, do you think I'd give it a name and it knows me very, very well, and it becomes my friend? I think it's gonna become a friend. Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to you know, really live life alongside you. It's gonna see what you see, both in the physical world and on you know, the digital world. And the strange thing about it is that you're going to be able to sort of point to things like say, you know, take a look at this. What do you think of that? Right. And it'll just know what this or that is because it has a kind of presence living life with you. It'll know what your style is, what your tone is and how you like to talk. Do you Um, think I'd be able to send it to work instead of me? I think that you're going to apply for a job with it. Mm. You know, your, your personal AI is going to get to know you so well and fill in a lot of the kind of gaps that you have to allow you to be your best self. You know, it, because it's infinitely malleable and adaptive, 
you know, and because I think we're designing it with such intention, it should complement the areas where you deliberately want it to augment you, to enable you to shine in the ways that, you know, you are sort of uniquely capable of doing and proud. So I think of it as a kind of like jigsaw puzzle, connecting with the areas that you choose to, um, you know, sort of amplify in your life. And yeah, I can imagine you introducing it to your friends or to your parents or taking it to work with you or switching jobs with you, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's gonna be an important part of life. So in a way, nobody has to really suffer with loneliness. Like there's a huge loneliness epidemic, right? Nobody has to suffer, or at least has tools to help them out with that period. And in the meantime, I think it'll always have utility. Like this image was generated with Copilot. That's right? awesome. So it'll That's always a super have cool image. Yeah, it will always have utility, I guess, till that time point. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mustafa. This was like a super exciting session. I, I had like these three, four questions for you, and I know we added a couple more questions because I wanted to explore some parts. Um, I learned a lot. And thank you so much for being here. This has been great. It's a lot of fun and thanks a lot. Cheers.